First tonight, Sir David Attenborough explores the art of John Craxton and its intense encounter with the natural world, as he looks back at the work of this intriguing but overlooked figure in the history of British art. Sixty years ago, I had just got out of the Navy, I'd got a degree in natural sciences, and I was in my first job, looking after the illustrations for a publisher. And I picked up this book, The Poet's Eye. Initially, it interested me because the illustrations were quite new. They were done by the artist drawing directly onto the plate that was going to reproduce it, autolithographs, they were called. But when I started to look at them, what pictures they were, what power they had. These were the English landscape, but the English landscape in a way that I had never seen it before. I wondered who on earth the artist was. Well, his name was John Braxton. He was brought up in a bohemian musical family and was free-spirited, adventurous, and a true visionary. Together with his friend Lucian Freud, Craxton saw himself in revolt against the established art tradition. His earliest work during the 1940s combined pastoral scenes with the modernist angst of his age. And along with painters such as John Piper and Graham Sutherland, Craxton was part of an artistic movement which would find a new way of looking at the British landscape, a modern romantic vision of a country menaced by war. When we were bombed out in 1940, everywhere London was dirty, and in a way one was driven into seeing the world in a kind of stressful way. These sort of trees have become distorted, and they had forms of great gnarled shapes like fists and gesticulating arms. And I found this sort of extraordinary, almost surrealist way these trees were coming over the walls at one as one walked underneath, as if to sort of grab one and menace one. It was only sometimes later that I realized that the brooding contemplative figure here is actually John himself. It was these haunted, undeniably melancholic pictures that led some critics to call him a neo-romantic, a label he didn't like. But then, as far as the fashionable art world was concerned, he disappeared. Now, a new exhibition at Tate Britain, the first major show in London since 1967, reveals what happened to him. And here's the explanation. In 1946, he went to Greece. Two years later, he painted this. Gone is that melancholy young man, those threatening gnarled tea roots. All is music and sparkle and sunshine, delight. Here I was joined by Craxon's biographer, Ian Collins, who told me more about John's life in the Mediterranean. <laughs> this picture is a fanfare for the light, the life, and the landscape of Greece, his, his, his adopted home already. By this point, he discovered Crete, which was his great love. He had, in fact, been posted missing because he'd gone native in the mountains, and his sophisticated friends in Athens thought he was in the wild west of their country, and where there were blood feuds, and mm. they thought he'd been abducted or murdered. Really? And when he re-emerged, he painted this picture of um, this great place he had discovered. He got a spectacular goat there. I mean, in this yeah. triangle, he shows exactly how a goat clambers in a tree. It's Absolutely. Entertaining, it really is. Absolutely. He was fascinated by goats. He said they are essential domestic animals in the Mediterranean, but they also destroy the landscape. Yes. And it's that tension that he found fascinating. Apparently, he's playing a, a pipe there. I guess that's an emblematic pipe in the sense of the pipe of Pan. Uh, definitely the pipe of Pan. John loved music, and he said that his pictures were composed like pieces of music, all about balance and harmony.
Fascinated by the qualities of the Mediterranean light, his painting was transformed. The landscapes become more complex, more spectacularly daring in their use of line. Well, this extraordinary combination of colours yeah. and lines yeah. is uniquely John, isn't it? Absolutely uniquely John. But it's also got the sparkle of the Mediterranean. Yes, hasn't it? Uh, he's got this dazzling light on the water in these broken, linear uh, streams of paint. It's a dazzler. I must say, the thing that interests me is this. Uh, at the bottom there, he's got a line for the, the frame, yes. which disappears. Yeah. Then above that, there's that bright green line, yeah. which actually then has its own life and goes for a walk up into the middle of the picture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All of which is a kind of frame for the composition. Yes. And it's even within the, within the composition, these lines change colour. Yes. Well, I think that is a ravishing picture. Yeah. However, these bright, scintillating pictures were thought to be too playful and decorative for British tastes at that time. Dispirited by the poor reviews for his 1967 retrospective, for long periods afterwards, John rarely exhibited at all. In his later years, he divided his time between his life in Crete and his studio here in London. It was over 30 years after I first saw those pictures in a book by John Craxton that I got to know him, and even went out to stay with him uh, in Crete. He was a man with a huge enjoyment of life. He loved riding across Europe on his tiger motorcycle. He loved parties, whether they were an embassy or whether they were down by the quayside. One of the great pleasures of life was to be taken by him to the harbourside restaurant and eat a meal of seafood, which even I, who am supposed to know about these things, found difficult uh, to identify. Life, said John, is more important than art. Those were his words. John died in 2009. He was 87. At his studio, it's as though he's only just left the room. I invited the art writer Hilary Sperling along to hear more about John's artistic influences. I, in a way, I think that whole generation were so excited by Picasso, and, and John, like all his contemporaries, was. There's a wonderful phrase in a letter he wrote in the war when he was very young about seeing his very first Picasso painting, in the flesh, I mean, as opposed to a reproduction. And he says, the colours ping and twang, like Spanish music. And I thought, my goodness, doesn't he do that in his paintings? Didn't he learn to do that? His colours ping and twang, I think. Well, there's a picture here, which is actually... It's up there, hidden in that balcony. I'd, let's see if we can get into it. Now, does that ping or twang? My goodness. It's completely grease, isn't it? But it's how he, how he uses these lines... Yes. Sometimes double and triple. Yes. There's, what, there's one, two, three, four there. Well, it's the contours of the light. It's extraordinary how he has split the light into it. He sort of tessellated it. Yeah. You look at the way the figures are outlined in a kind of penumbra. Well, they're the colours of the rainbow, aren't they? They are. That's what's so extraordinary about John Craxton. His paintings have to be looked at from close up because they're so detailed. But at the same time, the overwhelming effect is of of a flare of light. Uh, it's actually a painting of a dazzle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. It looks to me as though he found himself, made himself as a painter when he went to Greece. Mm. In the course of making this film, to my amazement, Another Craxton painting came to light, this time in the vaults of the Bristol City Museum. Only a stone's throw from where I've done much of my television work. I just had to see it. You must have a fabulous collection to be able to afford to keep a masterpiece like that in your basement. 
This is an absolutely crucial picture. In, in the, I've never seen it before. I, gosh. It's 1951. Yes. And we bought it in 1952. Well, clever you. Well, and it, it's magnificent, isn't it? it? It's, it's, it's miraculous. Look at this figure here in the, in the shade. Oh, and look, there's a whole, oh, there's a whole, I see there's a whole herd here. I think that's a cave where the goats have been kept for the night. And, and they've just been released and they're being milked. He'd, he'd been in Greece five years by the, when he painted that one, you see. He'd, he'd, he's really, he's really got the, the landscape and the people into, his, uh, into the marrow of his bones. Stunning. John had changed from that early troubled man, the poet in the landscape. Here in the Mediterranean, he found himself. And his paintings here, it seems to me, are full of delight, joy, pleasure in the people and the landscape and the animals. And joy uh, is somewhat out of fashion these days. But my goodness, it's, it's precious. <laughs>